most of you know, or at least have heard me talk about our son, Jefferson, and our daughter, Eloise, who we call Lulu. Uh, Jefferson is now well into his fours and Lulu into her twos. And I remember when Lulu was first born, as Jefferson had just started to begin to talk, I would often say to Maddie that I just can't wait for Lulu to be two and Jefferson to be four like they are now so they can talk to each other. Little did I know at that time what that would mean for my ears. I should have seen it coming because me and my brother argued all the time growing up, but I don't think either me or my brother were even half as stubborn as either of my kids. I mean, Lulu can barely even talk yet, yet somehow they still find a way to argue all the time about the stupidest of things. In the backseat of the car just last week, Jefferson said, as you may have heard him said if you've ever been around him, that his favorite color is black. He's obsessed with the color black. Uh, And so Lulu course, responded, said, no, white. One of the few words she could, she could say, she, she'll, she said, no, white. So Jefferson, of course, says, no, black, white, black, white, black. And then they get louder as they go, black, white. I mean, I had to roll up the windows at the stoplight so, you know, people didn't think I had a racist daughter. I mean, it was, it was bad. They're yelling this out the, out the window. What's astounding to me is that a two-year-old who doesn't even know how to tell the time or how to put on her own shoes, knows how to argue and to fight. There's something very basic, I think, in our human nature, our fallen nature that compels us from the very moment we learn to speak, to quarrel, to lock horns with one another. The sad reality is that as adults, We aren't so much better at this, are we? All you have to do is turn on the news and you'll find adults who sound like my toddlers arguing back and forth, engaging, locking horns with one another. Even as adults, we we fight, we bicker like children over the smallest of differences and what's worse is that we often make enemies and attack and even kill one another over our bigger differences. We live in a world today at war on multiple fronts in a nation with its people internally divided and at each other's throats constantly. And even... In the church today, there's ongoing conflict, discord, and division. And while living in such a world and nation at times can feel overwhelming and hopeless, we're reminded in Scripture that this isn't really anything new, but that this has been the way of our world throughout history since the fall. We're reminded in scripture that the very first pair of siblings, Cain and Abel, ended in one killing the other. The way of our world throughout history has been conflict and bloodshed. Yet Jesus teaches us here in Matthew 5 that the way of his kingdom is different that those who are truly a part of his kingdom do not seek violence, but peace. So look with me at Matthew 5, verse 9. Jesus said in this famous sermon, blessed are the, everybody say it with me, peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. Happy are the peacemakers. Why? For they will be called the children of God. Peacemaker isn't a word that we hear or use often today, yet its meaning is pretty self-explanatory. 
A peacemaker is one who makes peace. It's someone who actively works towards reconciling differences and and fostering ceasefire and unity among those who are enemies. Being a peacemaker, by the way, is not the same thing as being peaceful. A peaceful person is someone who's calm, who's, who's serene, but often avoids conflict. Right? So a peacemaker avoids, or a peaceful person avoids conflict. A peacemaker, on the other hand, doesn't avoid conflict. They don't avoid tension, but rather they proactively seek to diffuse that tension and to cultivate an environment of harmony. Jesus is teaching us here that one of the truest identity markers of someone who is a child of God is that they seek to make peace. Now, in the context of Jesus' day, when he spoke this, there was one particular group of Jews who really would not have liked this statement by Jesus. And I know this week, I know we always pick on them, but this week it's not the Pharisees. It's a different group that was known as the Zealots. In fact, one of Jesus' 12 disciples, it says, his name was Simon. This is the other Simon. He was Simon the Zealot. He, He was formerly before he followed Jesus in this group of Zealots. The Zealots were Jewish revolutionaries whose goal was to bring about the kingdom of God by freeing Israel from her Roman occupation. They were an underground militia group trained in combat for the sole purpose of fighting back against Rome and and making Israel once again a free nation. For two centuries, the Jews had been under foreign occupation, and they were oppressed by extravagant taxes, by violence, by religious discrimination. So under such circumstances, violent rebellion uh, against the Romans would have been a continual temptation for the downtrodden, for the oppressed, who longed to see Israel's former glory restored. But Jesus says here that while violence is the way of the kingdoms of this world, that the way of his kingdom was not to be one of violence, but of peace. Remember the prophecy in Isaiah 9, 6, it says of Jesus, the Messiah, this this promised future king of Israel that would save Israel. One of his titles given is the prince of what? Peace. Isaiah 52, 7, another prophecy. It says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Each of these prophecies shows us that the kind of king that Jesus would be and the kind of kingdom he would establish would be one of peace. See, the zealots hoped by their militarism to demonstrate that they were the true and loyal sons of God, faithful to the finish, even if it meant death. But here Jesus teaches that the status of children of God belongs to those who seek to make not war, but peace. Jesus says that those who work for wholeness and harmony rather than strife and discord, those who seek to reconcile others to God and and to each other are his true children. One commentator wrote, there is nothing more godlike. There is no more godlike work to be done in the world than peace. Peace making. 
peacemaking at its very is at the very heart of the gospel and at the very heart of Jesus. So with that said, understanding the importance of being a peacemaker as a Christian, what does it look like practically for us to be peacemakers? Well, I can't think of any better anything more helpful than looking at a real example from Scripture of what it looks like to be a peacemaker from the life of the ultimate peacemaker, Jesus himself. So turn with me to another passage. Turn to the end of Matthew, to Matthew chapter 26. Should have it on the screen as well if you don't have a Bible with you. By the way, if you don't have a Bible but you want one, we would be glad to get you a Bible so you can be able to look at the word together with us. Matthew 26. Fast forwarding once again here from near the beginning of Jesus's ministry in Matthew 5, from his sermon to the very end of Jesus's ministry, life on earth. Here in the dark of night, Jesus is found in a garden near Jerusalem, praying in distress, knowing the terror that was about, that he was about to endure. And as we read through the story, notice with me from Jesus' example three exemplary qualities of a peacemaker. Quality number one. A peacemaker doesn't curse traitors, but calls them a friend. A peacemaker doesn't curse traitors, but calls them friend. Look in verse 45. <clears throat> then he returned to his, the disciples, that is after praying, and said to them, are you still asleep and resting? He says, look, the hour has come and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Verse 47, while Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, arrived. With him, a very large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. Many of us, maybe most of us, are familiar with this famous story of Jesus' betrayal by one of his own 12 disciples. Judas, who had traveled with Jesus for almost three years, who had heard his teaching, who had witnessed miracles by Jesus with his very eyes, turned over Jesus to be arrested and killed for a mere Four months of wages. G Judas, his greed had taken such a foothold in his life that it so blinded him that he betrayed the very God who created him and called him. And notice, by the way, how he betrayed Jesus. Approaching Jesus in the dead of the night with a garrison of armed men behind him, he comes up to Jesus and he says, Greetings, Rabbi, and politely kisses him on the cheek. Notice that Judas's behavior was peaceful, he was polite, he was peaceful. But far from being a peacemaker, with a smile and a kiss, Judas delivered over Jesus over to a bloody and violent death. Have you noticed that Christians are really talented at saying and doing some pretty nasty things to each other 
all while being really polite and pleasant about it? Like, like as Christians, we can say terrible things about other people. We can say whatever we want, but as long as we add bless their heart at the end, like it's okay now, right? Like somehow, somehow it's spiritual, right? Uh, maybe we give a prayer request and, and frame it that way and it's okay. Like, oh, that brother Daniel, he sure has a unique way of interpreting the Bible. Bless his heart. He sure keeps us on our toes with his creative interpretations. Oh, that sister Sally. You know, her potluck contributions are always a journey of flavors. Bless her heart. You never quite know what you're going to get. Christians have a really curious ability to be outwardly courteous, but sneak in a little bit of curtness. We've mastered inflicting pain on others while somehow still being peaceful. Judas smiled, kindly greeted Jesus, but being polite doesn't always equate to me making peace. Sometimes it could even mean the opposite. On the other hand, notice how Jesus responds to Judas's betrayal. Verse 50, Jesus replied, do what you came for, friend. This phrase, do what you came for, you might have a version that translates that differently. The literal Greek um, into the English is for what you are come. So it's, it's a little confusing. Some versions will see that as Jesus asking a question, like, why have you come? Others would see Jesus as saying, for this you have come. However you translate that, notice the manner in which Jesus addresses Judas, the betrayer. He says, do what you came for, friend. He doesn't say, do what you came for, traitor. Do what you came for, you backstabber. After all I've done for you, don't you know who I am, you dirty sellout? No, he says, friend. Unlike Judas, by the way, Jesus doesn't use nice language all while twisting the knife deeper into his stomach. Jesus never harmed or rebuked Judas for his betrayal, but he loved him to the end. In fact, just a few hours before this, knowing he would betray him, Jesus got down on his knees and he washed Judas' feet along with the other disciples. See, being a peacemaker isn't just about keeping the peace with those who are friendly to you. But think about this implied in the very name peacemaker is that if peace needs to be made, that right now peace doesn't exist. But rather in the, in the relationship, there's bitterness, there, there's hatred, there's, there's hurt. Being a peacemaker Thus means that even when someone betrays or hurts us or attacks us, that not only do we not hurt them back, but we seek peace with them. We care for them. And we treat them not as our enemy, but as our friend. See, when we think of Judas, we think, man, that no good traitor. If you notice in the passage, they use the term, even the author, Matthew here, use it, calls Judas the betrayer. He, he replaces his name with the betrayer. Man, that no good murderous traitor deserves to rot in hell for betraying our Lord Jesus. That's, that's how we think. But you see, when Jesus thinks of Judas. 
Jesus sees a man who he created. He sees a man who he loves and whom he loves so much that he went up onto a cross and he took beatings for him and he shed his blood and he had his body broken, not just for Peter, not just for James and John, but for Judas. When Jesus hung on that cross, he wasn't just thinking about you or me. He was thinking about Judas. Jesus loved Judas to the end, regardless of his betrayal, because his desire was for Judas to repent and believe and be saved. The question is, when someone betrays you, when someone hurts you, when someone leaves the church and they mock you for your faith, how do you treat them? Do you give them what they deserve? Do you try to get even with them? Maybe you give them the cold shoulder and cut them off from your life and go gossip about them behind their backs? Or do you remember that they too are is someone who Jesus died for? And no matter how much they hurt us, that Jesus desires their salvation and that the way we treat them is possibly the greatest testimony of Jesus' love in their lives they may ever experience. One of my closest friends from high school went off to college in Florida and I went to California for college, but we would keep in touch often during my freshman year. About halfway through that year, my friend called me and immediately I could tell something was terribly wrong. Uh, he just sounded absolutely broken. He could hardly speak. He went on to tell me that his mom had recently discovered that his dad had been having an affair for years in fact, he had a whole other family in another state that he'd been keeping secret. On top of all that, when the affair was discovered, he was so ashamed, my, my, my friend's dad, that he refused to even talk to his own son anymore. As my friend was broken and in tears and so angry at his dad, I remember reminding him that as angry as he was, I told him, I said, right now more than ever, I said, you have the opportunity to demonstrate, to be an example of Jesus's unconditional love for your dad than you've ever had. And I said, and that's exactly what your dad needs right now. I can't imagine. I wasn't the one going through the experience. It was, it was easy for me to say that. I can't imagine the pain of betrayal my friend had to endure from his own father. But because of Jesus, my friend chose to be a peacemaker. Some months later, when his dad finally had the courage to call his son, my dad, or my, my friend, he showed only love and forgiveness to his father, demonstrating the love of God the Father to his own father. So you're never more like Jesus than when somebody betrays you. And in return, you show them kindness and love. A peacemaker doesn't curse traitors, but calls them friend. Quality number two, a peacemaker doesn't seek to harm God's enemies, but to heal them. A peacemaker doesn't seek to harm God's enemies, but to heal them. Look at verse 51. With that, 
with Jesus' arrest, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Upon Jesus' arrest, one of his disciples, who uh, the Gospel of John has the same story, who identifies this as Peter, pulls out his sword and attacks one of the men arresting Jesus. Now, before we're too hard on Peter, let's put ourselves in Peter's Shoes for a minute. For centuries, the Jews awaited the, the, their promised king who, who, who said who would rule on the throne of David as king forever and who would conquer God's enemies. For example, Isaiah 42, 13, a, a prophecy about the Messiah. It says the Lord will march out like a champion, like a warrior, he will stir up his zeal with a shout and he will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. So Peter, along with the other disciples, he was following Jesus, the Messiah, and he was awaiting for the time that, that he would call on them to take up arms and to fight against Rome and all else who stood against Israel. So upon Jesus' arrest, Peter thought... I guess it's finally time. So he pulls out his sword and he begins to start fighting for Jesus. In fact, in the parallel passage of the story, it gives us some more detail about the disciples' confusion on this point and, and it gives us more detail about Jesus' response. So turn with me, if you will, uh, two books over to the book of Luke. Luke 22. Keep your finger, if you can, in, in Matthew or a tab or something, but we're going to be in Luke 22. Come back to Matthew in a bit. We do have it on the screen as well. Luke 22. We're going to look at verse 35. Verse 35, just before his arrest, Jesus asked his disciples, he says, when I sent you without, by the way, the context of this is, is that same night. This is earlier in the night. He says, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they said. He was referring to a time when he sent them out on these missionary journeys. He said, don't take anything with you. Don't take, a, don't take an extra bag, a sword. Don't take anything. Just, just go and, and you'll be taken care of. But look at verse 36. He said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it. And also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. Now, when the disciples heard sword, they thought, all right, this is it. Like, it's, this is time now. It's time to get our swords. And, and so, verse 38, the disciples said, see, Lord, here are two swords. And then Jesus gives an oddly sharp response. He says, that's enough. Now, he didn't mean that was enough swords, right? Like two swords, 13 men isn't enough to like fight the Roman, the armies of Rome, right? Um, rather, we find this phrase used elsewhere in scripture, that's enough to mean this conversation is over, right? Like that's enough of this foolish conversation. See, Jesus was speaking to his disciples here in metaphor. He, he was trying to prepare them for the spiritual battle that was about to take place starting that night. But misinterpreting Jesus' words as literal and then only focusing on a small detail of having swords, Jesus ends the futile conversation. This was a classic scenario of you hear what you want to hear. They heard swords and they're like, man, let's go. Let's, we're ready to fight. After following Jesus for three years, they still didn't understand that Jesus didn't come to build an, an earthly physical kingdom, but he came to build a spiritual kingdom. They, they didn't understand that Jesus would build his kingdom not through the taking of life, but by the sacrifice of his own life. 
Notice with me a few verses later, which describe the events of that same night. Look in verse 47 of Luke 22. While Jesus was still speaking, a crowd came up and the man who was called Judas, one of the 12, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, notice what they said. They said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? They said, Jesus, we, we got the swords ready like you said to. We got all two of them here. Is now the time? But before Jesus can even answer, Peter decides, sure is. And he goes charging in, slashing off the right ear of the high priest's servant. And notice Jesus' response to Peter's action. Verse 51. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. See, Peter thought that he was being a peacemaker by attacking those who were trying to harm Jesus and stop his mission. After all, the most uh, way we use the term peacemaker today is to refer to what? To a gun. It's a peacemaker. The thinking is if we destroy the enemy, then we will have peace. But Jesus shows us here that being a peacemaker is not by attacking God's enemies, but by aiding them. To the very man tying up the hands of Jesus to take him to his death, Jesus touches his ear heals his pain. We don't bring peace to our world by hurting God's enemies, but by healing them. We don't bring peace to our world by hurting God's enemies, but by healing them. I had another pastor say to me just the other day, did you hear that the U.S. is now dropping off aid to Gaza? Can you believe, he said, that we're helping the enemy? My first thought was, why are we calling them the enemy? My second thought was, isn't that exactly what Jesus did? Now listen, I am not saying we should or we shouldn't be dropping off aid in Gaza, and I'm glad that is not my decision. What I'm saying is that it's a problem, is that it's unchristian when we look at any other person, any other human being, and we call them the enemy. Ephesians 6.12 says this, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. He's saying it's not against other humans. He says, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the, this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. By the way, he's not talking about human authorities. He's not talking about evil human rulers, but he's talking about the spiritual rulers, those evil spiritual beings in our world today who attempt to thwart God's plans. This isn't a political statement. What I'm saying is that no human being on earth today is your enemy. 
even if they attack you, even if they make themselves out to be your enemy. Just like Jesus was trying to get his disciples to see that Caesar wasn't the true enemy, that Rome wasn't the true enemy, what I'm saying is that the leader of Hamas is not your true enemy. Vladimir Putin is not your enemy. Joe Biden or Donald Trump, depending where you fall on the political uh, scale, neither of these men are your true enemy. Why? Because every name I just mentioned is somebody who Jesus created and whom Jesus loves and whom Jesus shed his own blood on the cross for. You say, Pastor Matt, but, but there's people that are opposing God and, and his work and they're attacking God's people and, and the work that God is doing on the earth. Don't we need to fight back? Yeah, we do. But we fight back the way Jesus fought back. That verse from Isaiah that I read, the Lord will march out like a champion, like a warrior. He will stir up his zeal with a shout. He will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. That was talking about the cross. This leads us to our third point, which is the third quality of a peacemaker is that a peacemaker doesn't save himself, but sacrifices himself for others. Look at verse 52. Oh, sorry, go back to Matthew 26. Matthew 26, and we'll look at verse 52. Said, Jesus said, put your sword back in its place. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Verse 53, he said, do you not think I could call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sit in the temple courts teaching and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. After telling Peter to put away his sword, Jesus said, look, I don't want there to be any confusion here. He said, look, uh, he said, I'm not refraining from fighting back because I can't or because I won't win the fight. He said, listen, I could call down 70,000 angels from heaven right now if I wanted to, to fight you and to defend me. Jesus wanted to make it very clear to all present that they weren't taking his life but that he was willingly sacrificing and laying down his life for them. So yes, we need to fight back the evil in our world today. But we need to do it like Jesus did. And Jesus didn't fight using a sword and shield. but by giving of himself. Colossians 1, 19 to 20 says, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile, to bring back together to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood. 
shed on the cross. What this means is that as Christians today, as imitators of Jesus, we are called, we have the high calling of defeating the evil in our world. We have been given the means to defeat all the evil, all the death in our world today. And we do this by giving up our own lives for God's enemies. By loving and praying and sacrificially giving of ourselves to those who are opposed to God. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 4 says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. As followers of Christ, yes, we are to battle, but it's a different kind of battle. One that seeks to transform hearts and minds through the power and the love and self-sacrifice of Jesus. You see, being a peacemaker is not appeasement. But being a peacemaker is costly. Being a peacemaker is not telling those who are opposed to God, hey, it's, it's really okay, like, like it's really not that bad. Um, everything's going to be all right because God loves you. It's not appeasement. Being a peacemaker means sharing the truth with the lost that they are lost, but doing it as their advocate, not as their judge. It means not only telling people about Jesus' sacrifice for them, but also you demonstrating Jesus' sacrifice for them by sacrificially meeting their needs at your own expense. You say, Pastor Matt, you're saying I should make myself vulnerable and, and potentially allow those who are God's enemies to take advantage of me and, and possibly hurt me? Isn't that exactly what Jesus did for us? See, I've noticed that it's easy to find Christians that are willing to fight for Jesus. But it's a lot harder to find Christians that are willing to forfeit the fight for Jesus. See, when the disciples saw that Jesus wasn't fighting, but he was allowing himself to be taken, verse 56 says, then all the disciples deserted and fled. Notice that the disciples were willing to die by fighting God's enemies. But they weren't willing to die by sacrificially loving God. God's enemies. See, it's easy to find a church today. It really is. It's, it's easy to find a church that, that's bold about taking a stand about all the evil out there in our world and, and calling sin for what it is and, and calling out sinners as sinners. Plenty of churches like that. Plenty of Christians like that today. But where are the churches and where are the Christians today who are willing to be vulnerable and self-sacrificial towards those who are enemies of God? What would it look like? How would our church look differently today if we as a church decided collectively that we aren't just going to sacrifice for one another but for those in our community who hate God and hate you. Man, I love that our, our church, I, I can make one phone call. Happened this week. 
I can make one phone call and, and say that there's a need that we need to, to raise some money for something. And people, uh, uh, not in the offering plate, people outside just, just personally will give of themselves to help a brother and sister in our body in need. Man, I, man, I commend you for that. I think that's awesome. Not every church is like that. But are we willing and are we going to do the same when the time comes to give up your own comfort, to give away your own finances and even your own safety for those men and women, boys and girls in this community and in this world who hate Jesus? but whom Jesus died to save. I told you about my friend who forgave his dad for his affair, but what I didn't tell you about is his mom, who was hurt even more directly and more strongly by the affair, of course. Because of his infidelity, she was encouraged by many other Christians and even by her own pastor to just divorce him, to move on with her life, to protect her from being hurt again, from, uh, for, to be hurt from him like that. But instead, this godly woman decided that even if he was going to be unfaithful to her, that she was going to be faithful to him. What that meant was for a few years, it was lonely for her. I'm getting emotional. She was like a second mom to me. It wasn't an easy time for her. But after a few very hard years, because of her unconditional love for him, he was shaken by that. he eventually came back to her in full repentance. He went to their church and he stood before their entire congregation. Before that pastor that told her to leave him. And with tears, he repented and asked the church for forgiveness. And now over 10 years later, they're still together. My friend who just last month had his first child with his wife can raise that child, taking them back home to see grandma and grandpa still together in love. While she had all the right in the world to make an enemy of this man who had betrayed her, who had so hurt her, this woman chose to be a peacemaker. And because of it, she won her husband back, not only to her, but to the Lord. Is it easy for them being back together? Probably not. Is it worth it? Though it's painful, though it's costly, being a peacemaker through sacrificial love, regardless of the result, is always worth it. Because when we, when you choose to be a peacemaker, you're fulfilling your image, your your duty as an image bearer of Jesus Christ. If I were to ask your closest friends and family members about you, would they describe you as someone who typically avoids conflict? Someone who maybe creates conflict? Or someone who seeks to resolve conflict, to dissolve it and to create peace? If we were to examine your life so far this way, the way you've talked to your spouse, your children, your your parents, the way you treated, the way you talked to your coworkers, your, your brothers and sisters in Christ, would we be able to describe you so far this year by your words and your actions as 
a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Maybe you're here this morning, you'd admit, you'd say, Pastor Matt, I'm not 100% sure that I can confidently call myself a child of God. Uh, I want to be, I'd like to be, but I'm not sure if I am. And can I just encourage you this morning with a verse, John 1, 12, says, yet to all who did receive him, speaking of Jesus, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Scripture tells us that if we believe in Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for us and we look to the cross and trust in what Jesus did for us alone for salvation, that Jesus gives to us the honor of becoming his children. If you have questions about that, if you have, you're confused, you have questions about your salvation, I just want to encourage you, come find me after the service. I, I, I want to challenge you. Don't leave here today if you have a doubt in your mind about your salvation. Come find me after the service. I'll talk to you today. We can set up a time later to talk. And I'll do my best to help you know from Scripture that you're a child of God. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for making peace with us through your broken body and your shed blood. I pray if anyone in here is not a believer, they're not your child, that you would save them even today. Give them the faith to believe. And Lord, give us the grace to be peacemakers. We ask this in your holy name of Jesus. Amen.